great. So I've got 18 minutes, so I'm going to get going. Um, things are changing very rapidly with CSS for layout. And I've been speaking for a couple of years about CSS grid layout. And something that people keep saying to me is, which is better, grid or flexbox? As if the W3C are creating some kind of fight it out between these two specifications. And that's not really the case, because how we should be seeing these specs is part of a new sort of layout system. And they're brought together by the box alignment spec level three. So I'm going to have a look at some examples of how they might work together and why we might use one or the other. And all of the code is online, so you can have a look at that later. So the modules that make up this new system for layout share some common features. They properly separate the display from the source. They give us true alignment control for the first time, allowing us to center things both horizontally and vertically really easily. They're also responsive by default. They remove the need to calculate widths for columns. And really importantly, they give elements relationship in terms of the layout. So one thing knows about something else that's in the layout. Because that's a lot of the problem with our existing layout systems, things like float. If I float one column left and one column right, and one of, one of them is taller than the other, I don't have any way to tell the shorter column that it should visually be as tall as the other one. And we've been trying to create these full height columns for years. I don't know if anybody can remember the faux columns technique. So we're using a vertically tiled background uh, to create the illusion of a full height column. And that kind of worked fine until we got responsive. And then it was really hard to deal with these tiled images. And it's why people jumped on this idea of using display table. Because the thing with display table is once you use that, it gives the things inside some sort of relationship with each other, which makes it easier to do things like full height columns. But full height columns are the basic behavior of Flexbox and of Grid. So this is a Flexbox example. I'm taking advantage of some initial default values of the Flex properties. Our sidebar and our content are inside a flex container, and the sidebar runs to the height of the content. Uh, the background color extends all the way to the bottom, which it wouldn't do in a floated layout. And we can see a similar example with grid. So this is grid layout. And again, our sidebar there goes to the full height of the content next to it. And in all of the examples that I'm showing you here, this idea of elements understanding themselves as part of a wider layout is really important. and It's kind of how it works. So I've been developing websites for a very long time. I'm kind of pre-CSS, um, and I was building um, layouts with CSS when Netscape 4 was around, if anybody else can remember that. Um, and this idea of separating our, our content and our markup from the presentation was kind of the rallying cry of that early movement to move people away from using tables for layout. You know, we were saying, let's separate our source and our display. But it's been a bit of a failed promise. And increasingly, actually, we're seeing people describing their layout in markup. If you think of things like the bootstrap grid framework, you know, you've, you've got actual classes describing what the layout looks like. Um, and we get away from this with our new layout methods. So here's Flexbox again. My navigation here is laid out very simply in a row with Flexbox, and I've used space between. So Flexbox is assigning the space left over after displaying the items. Now, if I want to switch the order, I could just use row reverse um, or column reverse if I was displaying in a column. We can also explicitly set the order using the order property. So I've got a bunch of items here. They're displaying in source order in a flex container. I've given them a number so we can see what the logical order is. And then we can change their order with the order property. So the source ordered number one is now three visually. And grid is even more powerful because grid lets us change the order of elements, not just in one dimension, but in two. So I've got a parent element here. It's set to display grid. And I'm creating a, a three column track layout. And I'm positioning some items here with CSS grid layout, grid column and grid row properties. Um, the value before the forward slash there, that is the sort of start line. And afterwards is the end line, which lets us do things like this. So the only constraint here is that the items we want to position on our grid, they have to be a child of the item that we've declared grid on, a direct child. But there's more, because we can sort of explicitly position things around the grid. But grid layout also includes auto-placement rules. 
And these allow us to essentially take a chunk of content, throw it at a grid, and it will just display it for us. So in our previous example, if I remove all of the positioning information from the elements on the grid, they're being displayed here by grid, um, each item in one cell. So I don't need to position them, they'll just be displayed like that. And if I add some more images to my gallery, now some of those images are landscapes, so they're wider. And I've added a class to the elements to say, that, well, this is a landscape image inside this, this element. And then I set the grid column end property to span two lines. So this has the effect of making landscape images span two grid tracks. Anything else that doesn't have a class of landscape spans one. And so the auto placement algorithm then lays out my items on the grid. And you can see it's left a gap there because it's left a gap because the image after the gap is too wide. It can't just fit into that little space. So by default, grid is progressing forward. It's keeping things in source order unless I do this. So I'm adding here a new property, grid auto flow dense. And this happens. So grid's now backfilled the gap. It's moved through, it's found an item that will fit in the gap after the item that it's had to drop onto the next row, and it's picked it up, taken it out of source order, and popped it in the gap, which is pretty cool. It's pretty magical, but also a little bit scary. Because, obviously, we could use this in a really good way. We could say, let's create a really accessible source document, something that will work with screen readers or any kind of text-to-speech, uh, something that will ensure people can tab around the document fine. That would be great. What would be bad would be if we were like, hey, it doesn't matter about source order anymore. We can just create a nasty old messy source and just drag things around because this all works. And even worse, I think that because things, because things only become a flex or a grid item if they are a direct child of a sort of wrapper container of a parent, there is a chance that people, and particularly authoring tools, visual authoring tools, might start flattening out markup. Because if everything is the child of a grid element, then you can just move it around. Uh, and I think that's a real danger, and I think there are lots of discussions to be had about this stuff and how we use it in the future, uh, and how we make sure that we maintain the accessibility of these documents. Uh, this is from the current Flexbox editor's draft. It says, order doesn't change how a document is read out in text-to-speech or change anything about the logical order. So we should make sure that any reordering we're doing is kind of visual only uh, and doesn't change the, the sort of logical order of the document. And that's going to require quite a bit of testing, I think. So it appears that the hardest challenge in web design is vertical alignment. It's something that we've been wanting for quite a while, and it's something that these new layout methods solve. And here I'm bringing a new player into the picture. This is the CSS box alignment module. It contains the features of CSS that relate to alignment. So it will actually bring the alignment capabilities you might already have started to play with in Flexbox. It's going to bring them to other things, and that's grid, but also block layout as well. So this is the vertical centering module, although it's not just about vertical centering. There's things like distribution of space and so on are dealt with in this module too. So if we're in Flexbox, we can set things like align or justify items on the flex container, and that will change the align self and justify self properties of the individual items inside. So as we've already seen, items in a flex container have relationship. So by default, the value of align items is stretch. So things will stretch to the height of the tallest element in that group. And we can do vertical centering. So we set align items to center, and everything will center against each other. And you can use justify self and align self on individual items to change how they behave rather than doing everything as a group. So here I've made the third item stretch rather than center. So at the minute, this applies to flex items. And the idea is that it will go on and it will apply to all other kinds of layout as well. So we're already starting to see that in the implementations of grid. So we can have a look at grid layout and see how these properties are being moved over to there. So I've got a grid here, and I've set align items to center. And I'm positioning my items on the grid, so each grid area spans four lines horizontally and vertically. And you see there's a little background image, if you can see that. And each of the four grid areas on the left covers four squares. It'd be an actual square. But because we're setting align items to center, it's centering within the area, just like the uh, flex items would. And we can justify the items. So we've got the same grid, same placement. The only change is that here I've got justify items center. And then we get alignment like this. And just like with Flexbox, we have the align self and justify self properties. 
And these will allow us to target individual grid items and change their alignment rather than doing everything as one big group, which is what I've done here. So box A there is showing the default stretch. It's covering the whole area because it's stretching. And then we've got one set to align self end, one align self start, and one align self center. So being able to align groups and individual items is really vital for responsive design to be able to get things to work nicely at different breakpoints. And it's where a lot of the hacks and things around floats and positioning that we've used for static layouts, it's where they started to fall down. And the other thing with these new methods is that they are responsive essentially by default. I'm sure most people here know that in 2009, uh, Ethan Marcotte wrote his A List Apart article and he talked about something he called fluid grids. So he was working with, responsive, with relative font sizes and he noted that grids could be treated in just the same way by dividing the target width of an element by the width of the context. And that gave a percentage, which we could use in place of an absolute size. And so it came to pass that we all started adding these percentages, these very unlikely looking numbers, to all of our designs. And we do have calc um, in CSS, which can make this a little bit easier if you've got support. But the nice thing with our new methods is they kind of just do this stuff for us. So we've already seen the most simple of Flexbox examples, takes a list of items and declares display flex on the parent, and we have the justify content property with a value of space between. And that value flexes with screen width. It'll assign more space or less space depending on the width that we've got. And that value is defined in the box alignment module. So Flexbox goes further than this though. It allows us to proportionately distribute space between the items. So the flex property is a shorthand for three properties. We've got flex grow, flex shrink, and flex basis. And the Flexbox draft actually encourages us to use the shorthand because it does an awful lot of stuff for us. We don't have to set all these things. But I think because of using that shorthand, it can seem a bit magical. And a lot of people haven't quite grasped how each of these properties are behaving. So here I'm setting flex grow and flex shrink to one. That means that every box I've got can grow and shrink to fill the space. But the ideal box width is 200 pixels. And that gives us three boxes of equal width. And I might set the items to wrap, so I can set flex flow to row wrap. And then I drag my window smaller, and I see that as the boxes get smaller than 200 pixels, a box might wrap onto line two to try and maintain that 200 pixels. So we've got the final box here taking up all the space on row two, because alignment is worked out on a row by row basis with Flexbox. That row's only got one item, so it's allowed to grow, and it fills all of the available space. If you don't want the boxes to grow, you can set flex grow to zero. And that will get you this at wide window sizes. If you're allowing the boxes to wrap, they'll still wrap, but the box that drops onto the second line won't fill the line. And you can target individual items. So I've added rules for box three. All boxes can grow and shrink from 200 pixels, but box three cannot grow. And we get this. So once the boxes stretch wider than 200 pixels, it stays at 200 pixels. But there's more because responsive design is really about proportions and things being in proportion to each other. So in order that we can maintain proportions, uh, we assign different values to the flex grow and flex shrink properties. So I've got box three here to flex grow two. The other two boxes remain at the default of one. And this happens. And what isn't happening here is that box three is becoming twice the size of the other boxes. What's happening is that the available space that's left after we account for the 200 pixel uh, sort of ideal width, um, that space is distributed accordingly. And if that sounds complicated, this is really useful. It's a Flexbox tester. You can put in your different values and you can see what will come out. And once you've got Flex Basis down, then you can have a look at CSS Grid and this FR unit, this new unit, a fraction unit. And it works very similarly to Flex Grow. It allows you to assign a fraction of the available space. So here's a very simple grid, a three column grid again, all with one FR as the width. So in the image, you can see that that's created as three equal width columns. If I change my definition and create one 600 pixel column and two 1FR columns, grid first gives that fixed width element 600 pixels and divides the remaining space between the other two. And if we change the last column to three fraction units, the remaining space is divided into four and again distributed accordingly. This, as with Flexbox, means we can create fully flexible layouts that have some fixed width elements in them, just like the holy grail layout that we used to long for. 
So the Holy Grail, uh, fixed sidebars, liquid center, with the central column being able to be first in the source order. And that's doing that with grid. And if you've not seen this syntax before, that's the CSS grid layout ASCII art syntax, or grid template areas. And that CSS gives you a layout, and it looks like this. Not that the Holy Grail is what I would encourage you to all design websites like these days, but being old, I'm kind of, it's kind of cool that we can now do it, finally. So, browser support. Flexbox, pretty good. And with Microsoft announcing that they're dropping support for IE below 11 from January, we'll hopefully see the back of the old Flexbox syntax that has kind of been hanging around. Um, Modernizer is a great way to detect uh, support for the properties if you need to fork your code. Grid, not so good yet. Interestingly, where we've got grid support, IE 10, 11, and Edge, uh, because this spec actually came from Microsoft. That's where it started. They've implemented against the early version, um, but that's already out there. People are using that who are doing Windows-only stuff. Where we are with other browsers. So the most complete implementation is the work that's been done by Egalia. It's in Blink, so that's in Chrome and Opera. You need to toggle the experimental web platform features flag. It's also in WebKit, uh, Nightly's um, prefixed. It's in Firefox, an awful lot of it's now in Firefox Nightlies. It's lagging a bit behind Blink, but not much. And Edge has put updating their grid implementation as high priority on the backlog. So we will get grid cross-browser in the very near future. And hopefully we're also going to start to see box alignment making its way into other forms of layout too. If any of this has been interesting, I've got lots and lots of grid examples up here. Um, and all the slides and all of the code that I've shown you is linked from this URL. Thank you very much.